looking forward to it. It's just a it's just for fun. fun. Yeah, exactly. For fun. Okay. Okay. I, I if it isn't I, for fun, it's not worth doing. That's right, exactly. I learned that from you. <laughs> well, I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> I suppose. Yeah. Now, I have a second question while we got. I don't think I ever asked this question. Yeah. How common is the name Saha in India? Is it a common name? There's a huge selection effect. It's a common name, but there's a huge selection effect. And that's because Indian society was pretty stratified. Yes, I know that. And in the totem pole of stratification, sahas, sahas are pretty low. Pretty low? Yes. Really? And so it took them a while to convect up to the surface. <laughs> Scatter up into the upper edge. So, so you don't encounter a whole large numbers of them. I have two other experiences with names in India, and one of them is the name Patel. Oh, those so, are very common. I know. Yes. And there's a there's a there's, so there's a, a part of comedy. a part of India. Yes. Is, 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 that's right. Yeah. There's a movie, a comedy about that, about a um, Hindu family in America, and the young man, born in America, yes. wants to get married, and his father is a traditional fellow from the old country, uh -huh. and he says, "You can't marry an American girl. You have to marry a Hindu. You have to marry a Patel." And he goes, where are we going to find a Patel? And the father tells him, you have to go to that province. So he goes to this province, and then he learns there are 30 million Patels there. And he, he's not allowed just to pick one and come back. He has to search. So he has to go to many, many Patel families. Yes. So that was that was Marriages used to be that way. Huh? Marriages used to be that way. You had to, you had to stay within your caste, but not within the same bloodline. Ah. So there are so there's a secondary indicator of blood, okay, which is more more it gets pretty complicated, right? And I understand that the, that the lowest caste, the untouchables, were the only ones that could could burn dead people. They, 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 uh, you know, it's not to, it's not clear which is the chicken and which is the egg. What? People who burned who had the profession of burning other people were considered unclean yeah. and therefore were at the bottom of the yeah. of the structure or whether they were the only people i mean it was so you, the question yeah. of how it began you say yes unknown. yes but it is a fact that only untouchables can, can burn people is that right or can, can yes you but is else? that something you, no you couldn't they would they would keep you out of it okay because because that's that was the, there that was there. the caste system that's right yeah. okay gotcha yeah. Mm -hmm. all these, I had a roommate in, in a graduate school, uh -huh. Krishna Yankar. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know the name. I never met, it, met him. But... He became the, the, the director of Guadalupe. Osmani. Yeah, Guadalupe. Yeah. 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 We were roommates, office space. We had a, mm -hmm. in a, a old ramshack building in Berkeley campus. Yeah. And I shared an office with him for two or three years. We became very good friends. Uh -huh. and anyway. And he told me many various stories about India. Mm -hmm. and his coming to but anyhow, anyhow, I learned that crayons is just a way, and it's red, green, pale blue, dark blue, and then crayons is an inscrutable color. You ran out of crayons. I ran out of crayons. <laughs> the things that would show on a white background, you know, you can yeah, you can put in well, faint colors and they would You're accepted ultraviolet. Right? Now, if I had your shirt, I could have put that. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that's you at Das Campanas on a birthday. Yeah. Ed Olszewski showed me. Oh, yeah. Ed Olszewski gave me the picture. Who gave it to you? Ed Olszewski. <laughs> Ed Olszewski. He's a marvelous guy in Arizona. Yes, yes. Yeah. A friend of mine in Cross, and we yeah. collaborate. Yeah, I know, no, he I said, Oh, you're going to this meeting. Here, here's a picture. I do recognize him. Well, I'm at the start. Okay, we're about to start. All right. We'll do what we can. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're all uh, wide awake. Um, 
after a very nice lunch. And so uh, we start the session with Abby Saha, who's going to talk about Aralara as a standard crayons probing the galactic bulge. And I'll warn you after 17 minutes. Thank you. Maybe. So I wanted to start out by wishing George a happy birthday. Um, there's a picture of him. Uh, apparently he was observing at Las Campanas Observatory on a birthday. And uh, somebody sent me a picture of him on uh, of the occasion of a past birthday. So I used it in the slide to, to make the point. So to the first slide doesn't move, oh, it does. So I'm gonna talk about a paper that was actually published about three years ago and uh, has uh, among the, the people who worked on it, particularly I'll call out Kathy Vivas, who was a, a very crucial collaborator. And there are people in this audience, um, Alastair and uh, Andrea Kunder, who were also uh, co-eyes of this paper, but I'll pass on. I'm not going to <clears throat> go through that, uh, all of that. So yesterday, uh, Barry told us about uh, the Sturch's uh, law, so that makes my job easier. Sturch observed that during the, um, uh, the phase of minimum light, uh, the colors are in B minus V and U minus V are almost flat. Further, he saw that when he looked at AB type RLRs with, uh, uh, near the galactic cap, uh, these colors from star to star uh, didn't change very much at all. And so, um, and, and, and could be, you know, uh, and that's the region where uh, extinction doesn't change much and can be easily accounted for. And when you do that and make some adjustments for what you think the metallicity is and what the line blanketing effects are, you can get a residual scatter in B minus V at minimum light of around um, 0.02 mag RMS, which suggests that A, that they're at constant temperature at minimum light, if you take the metallicity effects out, but uh, I'll leave that as a suggestion. But in any case, from an empirical point of view, they make exceptional markers of intrinsic color. So we thought given DECAM and its passbands, which are shown in this figure here, uh, U, G, R, I, <clears throat> Z is hard to see in this figure uh, and uh, it's sort of in here uh, and the Y band um, to show you which part of the spectrum they entail. Uh, you can look at an RLI star and here's an example, uh, get its, uh, its light curves in all the pass bands, measure it at a fiducial, uh, put a template through it. You can do that now that uh, perhaps wasn't available to, um, well, they weren't available to search at this time, uh, measure <clears throat> the colors at a fiducial phase of, uh, I think in our case, we used 0.65. Uh, and uh, relate these colors and try to see how they behave. So to do that, we looked at a globular cluster M5, where um, there are 47 AB type stars, 14 type Cs as well. Uh, this is a globular cluster that's high in galactic latitude, has negligible reddening, uh, but, 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 but something that you can account for very well. And here in the various bands, U minus G at minimum light, G minus R at minimum light, G minus I, R minus I, I minus Z, and R minus Z, this is one we will refer to a lot. Um, you find that for the type ABs, if you fit a, a mild period dependence, the residuals about that are 0.013. Now you may ask, well, in a global cluster like M5, all the metallicities are the same. So you're not factoring in this as a universal thing. And we, we have a program that's, uh, got data for many more globular clusters and we'll get to reducing those eventually. Uh, but the other one we did was Omega Sen, which has of course a large spread in metallicities and, and, and uh, stroth types. And if you do that, this number for our sigma R minus Z goes from 0.013 to about 0.04. So it's not the end of the world. Um, we, may, we may have to parse. <clears throat> Oh, yeah. Uh, and if you do the modeling, uh, let's say at the temperatures that correspond to minimum light, and you use um, Groot's models as a function of Fe over H running from minus two to plus 0.5, uh, except for uh, U minus G, uh, the run of other pass bands uh, or, or, or of other colors 
uh, is, uh, is actually quite mild uh, and mostly you're interested in, you know, somewhere uh, from zero to minus two point, uh, uh, to minus two, and there's not much variation theoretically, but we will get empirical data and verify it later. But we couldn't uh, resist the temptation of using this to look at the galactic bulge, having calibrated it for DECAM bands, and there are six fields uh, towards the galactic bulge that we studied. Here's uh, a bit of the fields overlain on top, B1 through B3. B1 corresponds to, is centered actually at, um, that's this one, centered at Bada's window. And we looked at fields at uh, uh, around the same galactic latitude, uh, oh. extending along different longitudes in one field at um, a higher, uh, uh, lower, higher, uh, uh, away from the plane, basically, 10 degrees away from the plane. And um, we, uh, in relation to M5, M5 has an FE over H somewhere around minus 1.2. And this is a distribution of FE over H for, uh, for bulge um, RLI rays from uh, Walker and Turner of magnitude one. Uh, in the mean, uh, M5 is a good representative, of, but of course the bulge has um, a larger spread, um, which eventually we will address when we have the whole, uh, the whole set of globular clusters to use. In the meantime, here's a U-band image of uh, the field that's centered on Bada's window, which we call B1. Uh, and uh, you can see how mottled it appears. And U, of course, the reddening produces, uh, the differential reddening across the field produces this kind of mottling. Uh, uh, it's just the number of stars change a lot. Is that 6522 down there? 6522 is hidden, oh, cleverly hidden in the, uh, ah. <laughs> because we thought it was going to be too so crowded to the. That's a cluster, goblet cluster. Yeah. The other yeah. That's the, this one here? Three. Yeah. No, I think there's only, oh. there's only two. There's only two. two. Right yeah, there. those I are the two. Yeah. yeah. Are, and these yeah. may be just bright stars. Yeah. 6522. Yeah. Yeah, so we cleverly tried to hide at least two of them um, between the, the chip and the chip gaps. Uh, <laughs> something we may have regretted later, but because the global clusters themselves are interesting. Um, uh, and um, we uh, found in the end 474 our ABs rediscovered them, but there are, most of them are in the, uh, but just a word about data crunching, there are approximately 60 fields in each of five pass bands per field, six fields. Uh, on average, and they vary a little bit, but on average, there are, on the deepest images, there are about 7 million stars per field. Uh, and uh, so in all, when you run the photometry, it's about 18 billion stellar images uh, done on uh, a little, uh, you know, a desktop Mac. <coughs> then you run all the photometry through, you, there were 25,000 putative variables that were sorted through um, period analysis, uh, of the ones that look like they might be RLIs, a light curve analysis, uh, and uh, in the in the field B1, there are 500 AB type RLIs, um, most of which are in common with the Ogle ones, and so we could use cross match the two to calculate the relative uh, efficiencies of both surveys, and that's all in the paper. I won't go into that. So you can use these colors that we that we fitted. Um, uh, you know, you take each of the RLRs and you measure the colors here. So if it's over here, for example, you would uh, say, well, that RLR has uh, a color excess of whatever these colors imply, apply a reddening correction to them. Uh, and in the first pass, we use a standard reddening law uh, and you get a histogram of distances because you also have the, uh, the, the, the absolute magnitude from our measurements in M5, assuming a distance to M5 and I think for the first pass, we adopted Andy Layden's distance. And here are the numbers we got. Now you see that in the red, they're not too bad, not too dissimilar. But as you go to G, and particularly when you go to U, they just fall apart. The histogram itself falls apart. And that shouldn't happen, right? And it's, it makes you suspicious of whether you're using the correct reddening. So if you plot, here's color excess in R minus Z, color excess in G minus I, similarly color excess in U minus G versus R minus, I, R minus Z, 
the x-axis is always R minus, x axis and R minus uh, Z, and um, the others are the different bands. And you see that because of the differential extinction uh, to different lines of sight and different RL iris in the field, they, they, they spread out over um, different color, uh, uh, different, uh, they have different color excesses and they correlate uh, one color excess versus another uh, with a characteristic linear slope. Uh, the dashed line indicates what you expect from uh, the standard reddening law. And you can see that in many of these instances, they are quite deviant and even flip sign uh, in others. So between the two of these things, uh, it's pretty conclusive that uh, the, the standard reddening law uh, is uh, not the right one to use. Any reddening law could take you to zero. Yes, uh, <laughs> I knew that question was coming. Um, the, uh, the reason for it doesn't is, has to do, we've got a whole set of possible reasons why they didn't go through zero, but most likely what's happening is we're comparing a color here to a color measured in M5. And so little 0.01 and 0.02 magnitude errors uh, compounded four times. Uh, compounded against uh, also multiplied by the slope and things will shift things around. But that's, uh, so I grant you that, 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 and I think that those are mostly measurement errors, but the slope is pretty, um, the slope differences are pretty compelling. Now, the, our iris are not just standard crayons, not just the color, but they're standard candles as well, uh, as has been known for the longest time. And so let's make, let, and, and we also know that the distribution of stars as you go towards the center of the galaxy, uh, of the bulge is very, very steep, something like R to the minus three uh, in, in, in density. So they, they really, the, den, the numbers of these things really peak up to the middle. So most of these are, are highly concentrated at the galactic center. And we're looking not far from it. And so the RL iris stars, uh, are really tightly distributed at, a, at, at the same distance. Now, if you say that the reddening is caused by foreground extinction due to you know, the, the, the spiral arms and the sheets of things through it and not so much in the bulge and images of other galaxies would indicate that that's not uh, necessarily a too bad an assumption. Then if you plot, sorry, if you plot the um, apparent modulus, versus the color excess, uh, that slope should correspond to the total of the selective absorption. Now, if you're gathering more reddening as you go by distance, for example, if there's additional extinction inside the bulge, then it would steepen this curve uh, and you would get higher values than the actual reddening. So let's watch for that. But we've introduced uh, this and we've got total to selective extinction for U, G, R, I, and Z, but I'm not showing it here. Um, and so these numbers, if their differences uh, in the slope should correspond to the slopes in this figure here, in, in these figures here. And in fact, they do to within 0 0.02, 0 0.03. Um, numerically. So I think this is not a circular argument, but it bolts, well, one bolsters the other. So that tells us that maybe our assumptions aren't too bad. And so let's lay out the total to selective extinction by wavelength. The bold black points are uh, the standard extinction according to McDonnell, uh, uh, to O'Donnell, sorry, and uh, the uh, ones with the error bars uh, are the ones that we derived. So the thing here is that R minus Z is the, uh, numer uh, is the denominator here. So R minus Z for the black points, for the bold points is the same as R minus Z for these points. And uh, so in these bands, the same R minus Z denotes a lower extinction than, um, and, and it crosses here uh, at, at U. You can, um, uh, if you, you can, render this figure in other ways that will look somewhat different, but just making it that. So if you apply this reddening law, then you get, never mind these large numbers for now, I'll come to that later. Um, 
they, they, they all line up in the different passbands. The histograms look reasonably similar in, in their distribution as they should, because it represents the, the number of stars, uh, the distribution of stars and distance. Uh, and for comparison is the one we had uh, showed you from the standard extinction law earlier. So um, this is uh, uh, the idea that, um, uh, that, we've, that, that, uh, that using the right extinction law actually gets us to um, a consistent set of, um, of distances, for example. Um, let's go back to this figure. We have here a mottled appearance, and I want to now break up these, the whole field into 30 arc second by 30 arc second squares. Um, only a very few of which have an RL iris star in them. But for those that have an RL iris star, I pick up the stars in that little box uh, and uh, let's say make a color magnitude diagram uh, and lay those 500 odd um, boxes on top of the color magnitude diagram from, uh, from those boxes on top, sorry, back up. This is the observed color magnitude diagram of the whole field in G minus I versus I. And when I do the correction, and so you can see how the clump, for example, is being moved along the reddening line and all of that. So this is differentially modeled and all messed up. And if you pick up the few fields that which have RLRs, you get this. You can represent it as a color-color diagram with the reddening line going like this. But the number of stars uh, is quite, uh, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of information in the z direction with the number of stars. And so now if I take every box in that field, even the ones that, particularly the ones that don't have RLRs, and then say that I'm doing going to do a two-dimensional cross-correlation of this figure from that box to onto this, then I can calculate um, color excesses in R minus Z and G minus I for each of those boxes. And each dot in this figure represents that box. The line that's shown here is the original uh, fitted line to the RL iris. And so uh, this cross-correlation process is actually producing uh, the same reddening law, uh, albeit anchored to zero points that are defined by the RL iris. And, and when I do that, when I, sorry, okay. When I do that, I get a color magnitude diagram that looks like this. Uh, this is G minus I, uh, corrected to I minus uh, to, to correct it uh, zero. And you can start to see a lot of features really pop out. Here's the blue horizontal branch stars, for instance. The clump has gone into here. And I'll bring up, uh, uh, talk about this in a little while, in, 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 in a second. Uh, and you also make a map of the extinction um, for those 30, you know, uh, granulated by those 30 arc second um, boxes. So this is the same diagram now, R minus Z versus I. So it goes from uh, the uncorrected obser raw observed to um, uh, the corrected field and tightens up. It tightens up everything except this. This is the foreground plume. And uh, of course, they're not reddened correctly because um, the reddening really is projected onto the bulb distance. Um, and so things that tighten up, we think are beyond the curtain of, uh, of extinction uh, and things that are uh, in front of it, like uh, the foreground plume um, actually uh, broaden out. Um, and so this is, these are the various features uh, this, and you overlay the AB type RL iris on top. So one of the features here is this, this feature that goes up here and, and, and will, uh, it, it's, it's pretty sharply uh, uh, expressed in this diagram and I don't know what order I had to talk about it. Yes. So uh, Mike Rich and I, and perhaps others differ on the interpretation of what this is, but uh, it you know, starts out at the bulge and goes towards the blue as it rises up. And one of the things you might consider is that these are blue loop stars. So they're super giants, um, two solar mass and above that, um, uh, uh, that, um, or then become helium burning uh, main sequence stars. And to look at that, um, these stars are in, in apogee and Vern Smith looked at 12 of these 
and found among, you know, so he got one of these, he talks about it's about um, 5,000 degrees, um, not hot, very high log G, uh, F over H uh, super solar, and the uh, 12 C to 14, and this is out of my wheelhouse, uh, is a ratio that depends on the uh, dredge up um, of, of, uh, of material from below. And from that, he estimates that the mass of this star is about 2.5 2, 2 solar masses. So that's an argument for why it might be these. There are alternative inter interpretations that uh, Mike uh, will probably talk about, or, uh, or else uh, we can arrange for uh, a physical match outside the room. Uh, anyway, Actually, so. I think given the temperature, of water <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so here is the um, reddening map from Schlegel, from the dust maps, Derby. Uh, and, and, and you can see this kind of feature, which is mainly the bulge. And this is uh, the same feature in our field. And there are lots of, uh, but, but, but you see a lot of high definition things, including a lot of these uh, round shell-like structures. Uh, I think Alistair is trying to tell me to stop. So um, I will. Uh, we have five other fields um, and uh, I'll tell you about it later. Questions? Paul. Those blue stars are just foreground subgiants. That you don't need any exotic explanations. We worked this out back in 1995. I'll Sick Vern Smith on you. Well, yeah, no, LG well, works in a very different field, much lower to the point. These are the same stars. He's it's looked at stars field. from the same stars. He, oh. We picked out 12 stars from, yeah. from that feature right. and he looked at them. But those stars are not it. foreground because they're at the bulge. They're behind the Because they're because behind the, the curtain. Is narrow. And so, so the argument is that if they were foreground, they wouldn't tighten up. Um, but the, they're really bright, and so you get Gaia motions. Yes, and Ga we have Gaia proper motions. We're looking at some of the Gaia proper motions, and they're not bulge. They have some proper motion, but they're not like the foreground, prop not as large as the foreground proper motions, but somewhat intermediate and small. So it may be that there's a feature uh, close to the bulge uh, that contains them. Or I don't know. This is a whole different discussion. Like two kilohertz away. I mean, that Gaia can measure that. Believe I think this is more than three kiloparsecs away. It's probably more like six or seven. Yeah, I think. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> more questions. Uh, so when you revise the extinction law to uh, better to have a better match uh, for the RLI ray distances, you get an average distance that if I saw it correctly on your plot was something like 9.5 kiloparsec. That's right. right. So the thing is that if you go, if that's adopting the uh, uh, latent distance to M5, if you go with the more revised Gaia distances, for example, with the Muraveva calibration, I haven't quite got to the to, to apply the, the, the Baylor Jones one, but uh, the Muraveva calibration brings it down to 8.4. Just, just another uh, short question. Uh, is, are those histograms corrected for the cone effect? Yes. So if you look, there's a dashed line. Wow. That's the raw density. And then these are normalized at nine kiloparsecs uh, normally. So, yeah. We've still got time for a question or two. So we have unpublished distance. Yeah. I was wondering um, about the other five fields. Are you going to apply a similar method? And do you still also expect to find so many R. Lyrae stars? And that's a huge number that you found in, in that field. I didn't plan to you for that question. But the answer is <laughs> we've done the analysis. We haven't had time to publish it yet. Um, uh, the reddening we see in, in, in these four additional ones, the reddening law comes out to be startlingly the same as what we got in V1. Uh, here, uh, 
the differential extinction isn't so high, so the leverage on that is a little less, but uh, this is consistent with the standard extinction law. That's 10 degrees away, and it's outside the oval field boundaries. This one was a problem. This one had the same, had the right slope, but it had a huge, it had, I know, it had a much steeper, uh, it had a very steeper slope, but it gave the same color, color, and the color excess to color excess relations to this. And you would think that that was um, like the whole curve had been lifted up, but that I think is telling us that we're looking we're continuing to see extinction along the line of sight. So that probably I think is the, is the exception that proves the rule for the other ones. Okay. Do we have any questions on Zoom? No. no? Okay, then we should move on. Right. Thanks. Let's thank Abby again.